Hello, everybody. Um, I think we are ready for recording. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you at this stellar panel uh, on uh, <clears throat> a highly topical and relevant uh, topic, nominally uh, Japan, China, US uh, power politics, uh, which we are launching uh, through uh, the EU Asia project uh, at the Robert Schuman Center at the European University Institute. And we are delighted uh, to <clears throat> Uh, almost provocatively hold this meeting uh, um, uh, as uh, 2022 is actually uh, the year of anniversaries uh, in uh, <clears throat> oddly enough in uh, it should be a cause for celebration in uh, US China relations and Japan China relations because of course uh, <clears throat> uh, this is 50 years since the no uh, normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and China and it's also 50 years since uh, uh, the Shanghai communique and Nixon, uh, uh, Nixon's famous uh, um, uh, visit uh, to the People's Republic of China. And fast forward to 2022, we are witnessing um, <clears throat> a very different uh, landscape. US-China rivalry is in full swing. And um, uh, we are uh, we have uh, the mixed uh, blessing uh, to have stellar experts uh, the very month after the uh, uh, fourth taiwan uh, uh, straits crisis straight crisis has been ignited um, we've had uh, live uh, ammunition fires missile drills uh, <clears throat> um, effectively military exercises and cyber operations mimicking uh, a blockade also of, um, uh, of Taiwan following Nancy's Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's visit um, uh, to Taipei. And we've also had, again, uh, other drills following the visit of another US uh, delegation of lawmakers to Taiwan uh, more recently in August. And uh, of course, <clears throat> this is part and parcel of uh, the very stormy waters uh, and uh, uh, international political situation we are witnessing uh, also in Europe uh, as uh, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine uh, ravages uh, uh, the country. Ukraine and uh, the specters of uh, stagflation uh, coming to <clears throat> uh, materialize in Europe also uh, energy, food and potentially even like a uh, 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 bigger economic crisis uh, in the world economy. So. Um, we are delighted to have um, from uh, Japan, um, now currently head of the Odaka Sadako Institute uh, at JICA and uh, uh, professor <clears throat> of uh, Chinese politics at the Faculty of Law of uh, uh, Tokyo University, Takahara Akio Sensei, who I am uh, uh, very proud to call uh, uh, a mentor. It's very good to have you. And uh, we are delighted to then have uh, the former head and uh, <clears throat> of the National Defense Academy and longtime China watcher um, and also US China watcher, I would say, um, Kokubun uh, Ryosei Sensei. Kokubun Sensei, thank you so much for being here. We are delighted uh, um, uh, to have you. And then <clears throat> here in the flesh, uh, right next to me, uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Yi He from Lehigh University, a uh, uh, world famous expert uh, on uh, Sino Japanese relations, uh, especially on the history issue. But more recently, she has ventured and written uh, um, very incisive uh, uh, papers on uh, a paper on uh, China's tactical detente, if you want, vis a vis Japan during uh, the Trump, uh, uh, during a time of uh, US China rivalry, especially during the Trump administration. And uh, to my right, we have uh, Professor Chen Hui Wu from Academia Sinica, who uh, is here for one month uh, also uh, stay in Florence. We look forward to a prolonged engagement uh, at EUI, who is, which is uh, your alma mater. You've got a PhD at EUI. And uh, Professor Wu has written extensively on trade law and also on uh, a very uh, important, uh, uh, a very important book from Cambridge University Press, as far as I understand, on semiconductors uh, and export controls, uh, uh, specific to high-end technology. So, without further ado, I'll stop blabbing. Um, uh, I'll leave uh, 10, 12 minutes at most uh, for the pitches from the presenters, 
and we look forward to fruitful discussion. And uh, Takahara Sensei, the floor is yours. Uh, we'll, <clears throat> and Takahara Sensei will talk about uh, the prospects and the present of Japan China relations, and then we will move to a Japanese perspective on US China relations, Chinese policy to Japan amidst US China rivalry and Taiwan's positioning uh, amidst uh, all this uh, uh, stormy uh, waters. Thank you. Takahara Sensei, please. Present and prospect of Japan-China relations is the topic that I shall yes, we discuss can see it. Yes. in the next um, 10 minutes or so. And um, you know how bad Japan-China relations were in 2012 when we clashed very badly over the Senkaku Islands. But you see the resilience in the Japan-China relations. If this picture on the very left, uh, Abe uh, eventually made a uh, big successful um, visits to China. And um, Xi Jinping came to Japan, uh, if you remember, uh, two, uh, three years ago to attend the, um, the uh, what was that, the G20, was it the APEC uh, that was held in, uh, it was a G20, G20 meeting in Osaka. And Abe treated him in a special way, uh, you know, um, uh, treating him with a with a special dinner and in december abe visited china again for the trilateral so things were going rather well they decided to have xi jinping as a guest the following year in april however uh from 2020 especially um a lot of troubles arising between the two countries has been an increase in china's coast guard vessels around the senkakus and uh, coronavirus came people were very happy how China treated this um, pandemic and uh, what happened in Hong Kong actually from 2019 that you know many Japanese have lived in Hong Kong worked there and we all fall I mean many of us fall in love with Hong Kong so witnessing what was going on in Hong Kong 2019 2020 this was really really heartbreaking for a good number of um, Japanese and the Uyghur issue of course and this year, China did not, has not criticized Putin uh, for the invasion. Um, you know, uh, the announcement by the Russian side is that uh, in the meeting with Putin, uh, or sorry, the phone conversation Xi Jinping had with Putin one day after the invasion on the 25th of February, uh, Xi Jinping actually stressed that he respected the actions adopted by the Russian leadership to deal with the crisis at hand. And of course, this was um, uh, this attitude of China towards the Uyghur, uh, sorry, the Ukraine station is not welcomed by the Japanese people at all. But to put this in a little more systematic um, way of analysis, uh, this is the very simple analytical um, framework that I use to analyze Japan-China relations um, and uh, I sort of categorize all sorts of factors that affect Japan-China relations into four uh, categories and the first one people's perceptions and people's emotions and identity you know what's in people's mind um, I think you're familiar with this this is the famous uh, um, public survey that the Genron NPO and its counterpart in China conduct every year uh, since 2005. And you can see that um, last year, the result was such that uh, in Japan, over 90% of the Japanese uh, had a negative view of um, China. And on the Chinese side, uh, that is the, sorry, what I just said is represented by the red line here. Uh, but if you see the green line, that indicates the percentage of the Chinese people who have a relative, who have a good image of um, Japan. It used to get better and better, but for the past two years, it stagnated and went down last year by uh, 13 points. And um, so this is a big issue that affects um, domestic politics and it is affected by security uh, issues. So you see the arrows, you know, um, uh, especially on the Japanese side, it's the security situation that affects people's perception of China and people's perceptions will affect um, the attitude and the policies of the politicians. Uh, that's the kind of um, 
linkage that we find. And on the Chinese side, it's very interesting, this uh, increase in the percentage of people with a good image of uh, Japan. Uh, and we find that this corresponds with the increase in the number of Chinese tourists that come to Japan. But as you know, uh, and as you can see, if you can read the small, sorry, the letters are too small, the font is too small, but this year on the very right is 2019. And there is no figure for 2020 and 2021, obviously because of COVID. Uh, so there is a hypothesis that um, this uh, stagnation and this decline in 2020 and 2021 is caused by the lack of Chinese tourists coming to uh, Japan. So this could, I mean, this could be a part of the reason why um, the Chinese perception of Japan has gone, gone down. And on the Japanese side, um, you know, in the public survey, they ask, why do you have a negative view of China? And recently, it's because the top answer uh, is this, the increase in the, um, or, you know, the fact that the Chinese send their vessels and aircraft over to the Sen Senkaku. Sen and the blue line indicates the number of boats that come into the contiguous, and the red line indicates those that actually come into the territorial seas. You know, uh, we were discussing the 2008 uh, in intrusion that took place for the first time to claim sovereignty. You know, before this, there were a lot of uh, research vessels coming in, but for a long time, the Chinese had hesitated uh, sending their boats into the territorial waters and to the contiguous zone, but they seized the opportunity in 2012 and uh, increased their act. Uh, in, in this way, and this is uh, very much disliked by the Japanese um, pu public. Um, international environment, what's most important is the America factor. And with our alliance, uh, it's closely related to the America factor is closely related to the security uh, issues. And usually uh, when Beijing has um, bad relations with Washington, they turn to Japan. This is happening um, at the moment, uh, partially, they're always looking for opportunities to drive a wedge between Washington and um, Tokyo. Uh, they have hopes on Europe too, right? So whenever they have rows with uh, Washington, they, they used to turn to Bonn now to Berlin and other countries in uh, Europe. But nowadays, because the contest between uh, the U.S. and China is becoming uh, very intense and a lot of pressure from the United States about um, high-tech decoding and so on and, and so forth. Uh, there could be another um, uh, element coming in in the connection that I just uh, mentioned. Um, another area is domestic politics. Uh, you know, in Japan, we were discussing this uh, yesterday too, uh, but the Japanese public want a prime minister that will stand firm against all the provocation uh, and the challenges that come from um, China. But at the same time, they understand the importance of Japan-China relations. That's shown every year in the public survey that I uh, mentioned. Uh, a good number of Japanese, um, usually about 70%, these days, 60-something uh, percent uh, the, of the Japanese find Japan-China relations very important and therefore, uh, we also want a prime minister that will try and improve or to stabilize at least our relations with um, China. So we want a prime minister that can do two things. One is to stand firm and the other is to stabilize and if possible, develop uh, relations with China. On the Chinese side, um, they cannot show any weakness to the Japanese, especially in front of uh, the leader's political rivals. So. Uh, this year, when they have the party congress, is a very sensitive year in particular, right? So 10 years ago, when Ishihara started saying that he's going to buy the Senkaku Islands, he did it at the very wrong timing, I, I would say. But anyhow, um, this year, the issue is more with the United States and um, Taiwan. But anyway, as far as Japan's concerned, uh, not only, you know, of course, not only on the year you know, of the party congress, but all the time. Uh, relations with Japan is a sensitive political issue uh, in Chinese domestic politics. So we would rather have a uh, Chinese leader with a solid um, consolidated power base, and uh, then he will be 
um, able, on, and only then, with the consolidated power base, he can extend a friendly hand towards um, Japan. So that's the situation around domestic politics um, in China. Economic interests, usually, of course, it is a positive factor that um, will stabilize and promote Japan-China uh, relations. Um, you can see oops, in this uh, table here, sorry, this is a bit old, it's um, two years ago, but basically the situation has not changed. You see the trade total, these countries are Japan's major trading partners, and you can see that our trade with the PRC is outstanding. You put our trade with the USA and EU together, and it's just above the trade that we do with the PRC, one country. Uh, so this is the reality. Um, and oops, I have more. Yes, yes. Sorry, this is in Japanese, but this is 2021. Uh, this is looked at from um, China. Uh, from the Chinese side, the number one trading partner as a single country is the US. And the second is um, Japan. Uh, so still, um, Japan as a trading partner is not unimportant uh, for China. And if you remember in 2010, when the fishing trawler collision incident happened, uh, China did impose economic sanctions on Japan, but they did not do that two years later when there was a bigger clash over the Senkakus with um, Japan, uh, because our understanding is they learned that these economic sanctions backfire, and especially uh, if they um, uh, implement such economic statecraft to Japan, which is a very important provider of uh, key um, uh, parts uh, and machinery, uh, then that backfires in a big way. So and I think that was one of the uh, important reasons, uh, one of the important reasons why uh, China did not impose any economic sanctions in 2012. Um, okay, uh, but and finally, uh, let me just say that uh, well, that's the basic uh, situation of Japan-China relations um, to today. So there are problems uh, in three major areas: economic interests. Yes, it's okay, but a lot of the Japanese companies are. Uh, um, uh, in, what's the word, uh, they don't know how to move uh, in the midst of the intensifying US-China um, uh, contest over high tech. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, when they do business with China, they always have to be extremely careful uh, whether it's going to touch um, any area that America is imposing sanctions on and so on and so forth. So this is a very uh, it's, it, it, there are problems in the economics area too. But finally, let me just say um, that uh, when we look at the future prospects of Japan-China relations, um, we cannot be too optimistic uh, because the two-pronged approach that I mentioned yesterday, that is we have to compete and cooperate at the same time, um, it's going to be increasingly difficult to do the two uh, simultaneously. Um, and it is contradictory inherently, uh, and um, the difficulty will increase because the competition will intensify uh, on the one hand, but cooperation will deepen on the other. Uh, so we must have the resilience and wisdom to live with the contradiction. And at the same time, since our nations will be divided, uh, we shall need to use a lot of time and energy, especially the in politics, those in politics, um, uh, because internal coordination and persuasion uh, will be needed uh, to, you know, persuade both sides that the middle way is the only way to go forward. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, and thank you also for bringing <clears throat> in this variegated view of uh, Japan needing to have a resolute stance on one, uh, on one side uh, <clears throat> and on the other one to stabilize relations also because of uh, uh, business interests and, and the need, of course, for a degree of um, stability in Japan-China relations. I'm glad that Takahara-sensei mentioned uh, the, uh, the increasing, increasing uh, incognita surrounding U.S.-China rivalry, U.S. businesses too 
as made evident in a business uh, survey published by the US-China Chamber Business Council a couple of days ago, made clear that US businesses too are very wary <clears throat> of the uh, <clears throat> risks associated with, uh, of course, supply chain disruptions, especially of the geopolitical type. And on this very note, uh, I'm glad that we have uh, uh, non less than Kokubun uh, Ryosei Sensei to uh, uh, tell us uh, what is it? Uh, what is the perspective from Japan uh, on U.S.-China rivalry and the impact that it has? Um, so, Kokobun Sensei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jirio. Uh, I'm sorry, I had not uh, prepared uh, any uh, paper, so I'll just uh, look at my face only. Uh, the people always talk about uh, engagement. That was uh, over or not uh, to China. I think there are three kinds of uh, the engagement uh, uh, theories. I think one uh, that was uh, created by US, particularly from uh, Clinton period. Clinton's engagement started in 1990s and then uh, uh, their image on China, uh, that was uh, China could be changed uh, in the future. Uh, and there was strong uh, expectation uh, that is, uh, China is going to be, you know, going to uh, more, I say, uh, marketized, and then uh, going to be probably a capitalist society in some time, and in the future, uh, democracy. So, so China is going to be something like uh, U.S. society in the future. That was a kind of expectation, and the U.S. policy always, uh, you know, doing that just like this. Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, probably Iran was so too, and Vietnam, and the expression always high. So uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, those countries going to be probably something like uh, US society in the future, but the whole faith. Uh, this time China was, uh, you know, high expectation, of course, because the Deng Xiaoping's uh, open, uh, opening and uh, the reform policy and marketization uh, was going on. And uh, so that why uh, US has a very great, uh, I say, a sense of uh, a betrayal by China. Uh, so uh, now the Xi Jinping uh, has been stressing the concept of a Marxism, you know, all the way. So uh, the Deng Xiaoping, uh, the name of Deng Xiaoping, he does not talk about his, oh, even his name. So a reforming and opening, that was is also diminished, you know, decreasing. And the Japanese engagement, it's a bit uh, different. That's the number two. Well, uh, the, is China going to be American society? Uh, probably there was no such high expectation at all. Uh, it should be very difficult for China to be changed, uh, but uh, could be changed partly. So the, the, the Japanese engagement was always, uh, we should uh, China get into involved in uh, international system or institutions like uh, WTO, and sometimes uh, used uh, you know the ODAs. So I think that, that Japan you know, is a small country still <laughs> and uh, cannot make any big change, uh, makes, China, makes China into the international community. That's a huge task. So, so try to, you know, uh, you know gradually, uh, you know, China may try to make a change. So, so uh, the expectation was, expectation was not so high because uh, we had a uh, you know, long time uh, battle, uh, particularly on the history issues uh, since the 1950s. And uh, so we very much tired about the China's always talking about the history, history, history. And uh, probably, you know, China is China, that kind of sense, but still strong. But uh, partly, of course, uh, introducing uh, the marketization uh, and the opening, of course, China could be changed in the future. Uh, but not totally at all, probably. China is China. But the number three uh, idea 
on the engagement that was uh, proposed by uh, that not that is not the uh, uh, engagement at all, but uh, the Kissinger's idea. Kissinger's idea is a very unique. Uh, started uh, from uh, 1970s. China could be never change. Uh, China is China. Always China is China. So it's it's impossible. You know, we we make China you know make China China changed. So so uh, difference is there. Uh, so you have to talk first, and you have to negotiate, and then make a compromise compromise or not. So I think uh, the power politics is all, always dominated. That is the Kissinger's idea. So, so there are several types of engagement uh, or thinking. And uh, uh, of course, as I said, the uh, US had a great uh, you know, sense of uh, betrayal and so discouraged by China. And now, as you may know, the, the mutual image of about two countries, United States and China, so worsening. And, and so we are surprised because the Jap Sino Japanese uh, mutual image is so, so bad for many, many years. But now, a day, the US, uh, China, the mutual image is so worsening. The human rights issues, uh, Tibetan issues, Hong Kong issues, the, of course, the Uyghur issues, of course, the Taiwan. So many problems uh, of debating, but we don't know about the future. Uh, it's uh, hard to tell because uh, if you look at the domestic uh, situation, the both countries, uh, Biden uh, administration is going to have a, a midterm election, and everyone, you know, now expects probably the Democrat group could uh, will would lose and uh, tremendously or not, I don't know, but uh, anyway, we'll lose. Uh, so probably the domestic uh, uh, situation, the economy is uh, you know, awful. So I, I think uh, Biden administration must uh, focus on the domestic issues. Uh, China issues or foreign issues might be, well, not the top agenda at all, probably in the future. The Xi Jinping, of course, uh, the uh, 20th party Congress is going to be held. In, in October. And then, the, you know, but the, he has so many problems too. Of course, the first, he has to consolidate his leadership. And the secondary economy is almost, uh, you know, as you may know, it's uh, almost uh, oh, a disorder. So you have to uh, tackle on the uh, economic issue. The third, foreign policy, because China is so big and now uh, China is a role in the international community is so big. The particularly, I think uh, the US factor. So, so the uh, China's uh, uh, relations uh, with the US, that is going to be the key. So stabilization, uh, that is a key word for probably Xi Jinping. So, uh, pro so, so I, I think uh, particularly these days, uh, the China's uh, policy to US really moved, uh, started moving, uh, particularly after, uh, I say, April or, and uh, May this year or so, after the Ukrainian issues happened. Uh, the China stands toward uh, US, uh, you, know, you know, behind the scene, really changed. Uh, uh, many things happen. For example, I will show you one thing. The Kissinger's 99 years old uh, vast day. Uh, that was uh, May 27 or so. And May 31, there was an online birthday party between China and Japan, uh, China and the United States. And altogether 600 people participated in. And then the 1E, uh, took leadership, and then uh, he he made a very interesting uh, speech about the U.S.-China relations. Uh, that was uh, we never seen such a bad relationship, and we have to do something. That was uh, his statement. That was partly uh, uh, reported to Hong Kong newspaper or something, and then uh, we realized. 
that kind of party and many others. For example, May 26, that was very famous uh, speech by uh, Brinken, Mr. Brinken at the George Washington University. Uh, that, uh, you know, the last year, uh, within only four months, uh, almost uh, uh, 100,000 100, Chinese students, uh, you know, got the, uh, issued visas, uh, that kind of things. So, and also many, many, many things. Uh, I, I have, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I, I've studied on that, uh, you know, history. Uh, and uh, many other things, but at the same time, China's stance to the Soviet, uh, Russia has been changing. And as you may know, the, uh, the uh, vice uh, minister, uh, Mr. Luo Yutan, uh, he was uh, removed uh, from a vice minister uh, level. And then uh, that, this is my hearing and uh, many other uh, younger uh, Russian school uh, diplomats in the foreign ministry, in China uh, left. So I think almost uh, not collapse, but uh, you know many trouble happen uh, in the Russian schools in in China. So uh, that why you know the China's stance uh, changed uh, very much. I think uh, from uh, May or so, May and June period. Uh, so, so there was a the, 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 the you know negotiation process behind the scene too. So, so, so uh, for example, of course, uh, you, if you look at the uh, US-China relations, uh, the environment issues, those issues, of course, very clearly uh, we, we, we could see. Uh, and then uh, Ms. Peros uh, visited Taiwan. Uh, that happened, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, that caused a very, uh, complicated uh, situation between United States and China. Uh, China did not understand uh, the separation of uh, powers uh, in, in the beginning. And, uh, and of course, uh, the Congress, uh, the speakers of uh, the House of Representatives, uh, she was uh, representing uh, that the Congress. But the White House is a bit different, <laughs> as you may know, uh, the interesting story. Uh, because uh, there was, uh, you know, the uh, telephone conference, telephone phone conference uh, between United States, uh, Biden, and the Xi Jinping, uh, June 28 or something, 27, 28. And then uh, a week after, the Peros visited uh, uh, the Taiwan. And then so that was a disaster. Uh, so, and then uh, in China, within China, there was a really discussion. And uh, you know uh, there was no concept of uh, separation of uh, powers, so got angry. But uh, but still, e even in that time, uh, partly we guess we speculate, uh, you know, military to military relationship was going on still, and uh, uh, probably Washington, uh, White House, and uh, uh, probably Xi Jinping side uh, at a certain. Uh, I think uh, probably, you know, the not dialogue behind the scene, we don't know. But anyway, uh, still, it uh, seems to be going on. And uh, in that case, uh, I don't know, still, we are doing a research on that case, in the Taiwan case. And uh, relatively, uh, Taiwan uh, government uh, was uh, rather, I say, rational. And uh, uh, rather deliberate, I say, uh, you know, uh, cautious about uh, their uh, uh, behavior. So, uh, you know, much more, I say, we, you know, deliberate than, than the down first period. So this is my observation. At the same time, China's uh, military exercise was okay, but we still, you know, it's not clear that uh, uh, they are uh, stationed, but, uh, uh, did not uh, have, a, you know, did not uh, execute it, did not implement it uh, fully uh, station, but uh, <laughs> it seems to be very quiet. Why? Now, the reason is quite simple, because the U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, and Japan watched, and of course Taiwan watched, how, how sophisticated Chinese military 
exercise. You know, we we really, you know, that was we expected. We expected. So so I don't know the exact result, but anyway, uh, this is a, you know the situation. I think so. Still, uh, U.S. China to talk uh, probably will gradually will be removed. Uh, well, no, sorry, we recovered. So I think uh, uh, you know no. November or so, uh, G20 or APEC meeting, uh, they're going to be probably summit meeting. So of course, uh, US, uh, China's, uh, you know, bad relations and uh, are very uh, many complicated issues uh, they have. That's no change. That's uh, totally different from before. But at the same time, uh, if you uh, look back the history of uh, US, uh, uh, Soviet, uh, conflict, Cold War. Is the uh, United States trying to, you know, make a uh, change uh, Soviet society? Never, never. Uh, Soviet could not be changed, but suddenly they collapsed. They collapsed. So, so now, you know, now U.S. realized uh, they cannot make uh, China changed. So I think uh, the dialogue. Uh, uh, just like it's in some ways very hard, not fast, but not quick. So I think uh, probably you know the uh, dialogue will be started uh, uh, gradually. So uh, uh, now Japan uh, uh, watching the situation. Uh, Japan is busy because uh, our very important uh, uh, position that is uh, Mr. Abe was uh, a kid. Very sad story. And the LDP is uh, uh, in some some way I say uh, under, under trouble, but uh, we are watching, of course, on the foreign policy and that aspect too. So this is why recently uh, Akiba, Mr. Akiba, and uh, Yan Chiesu had a long, long uh, uh, discussion for seven hours. I think uh, probably Mr. Kishida and uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, probably summit talk. Could be discussed in the future, probably after the party congress and uh, midterm election. So that is a G20 or something. So we are not sure about it. This is a situation going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one, one thing I forgot. Please. Why? Why? Uh, you know, the uh, China uh, started talking to United States mm. more actively. Mm. And uh, uh, you know about uh, you know Russian relations uh, a bit uh, changed. Right. So this is a reason probably the Ukraine in that war. Mm -hmm. uh, they very carefully, very carefully tested about it these days, mm -hmm. and then their conclusion seems to be uh, there is a the word uh, I found. Uh, uh, this is something uh, new, new war, new type of war, mm -hmm. since war, Gulf War, since the Gulf War. So, so you know, uh, I think China found uh, kind of a hybrid war this time, and the uh, U.S. role behind the scene, mm -hmm. and of course uh, British role, of course intelligence and something, and uh, of course a U.S. role was very, you know, important in this war. Uh, this time, and probably China watched that. And then uh, Taiwan issues are uh, uh, quite similar. So in some ways, right? So I think uh, probably China became a little bit more uh, careful about, you know, uh, China has been really carefully watching Ukraine's uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, <clears throat> really uh, a lot of food for thought and for further discussion in the Q&A session. What I take away from your uh, uh, presentation is that power politics uh, have never really abandoned us, uh, have never been away. Even, of course, when Nixon and Kissinger inaugurated their linkage policy by opening and their triangular diplomacy, as you said, by opening uh, up to Russia, to China, to the People's Republic of China in 1972. Certainly it wasn't for <clears throat> uh, uh, to engage China in the sense that it wanted to have noble, uh, generous uh, uh, spirit of changing, uh, Americanizing China, but it was really 
realpolitik of the old kind um, and uh, arguably uh, business interests also fed into uh, the engagement of China, uh, both from the US and Japan in the 1990s, rather than more noble, uh, no, more noble interests. But of course, power politics and US uh, unipolarity kept uh, the order in place. And we're getting to, to these current tensions uh, because of the changing picture, a uh, changing power balance. What I also like to uh, uh, emphasize from your presentation, and we'll, swift, uh, we'll swiftly, uh, swiftly move to Professor Her, is that you uh, um, uh, posit that, of course, China is uh, rethinking uh, its posture vis-a-vis -vis the US by uh, um, engaging uh, and uh, ameliorating ties uh, with Washington. I wonder, then, and this is a connection with both you and Takahara Sensei's argument that uh, as Xi Jinping consolidates his domestic power base, uh, this is an argument you also make in the Chibok Seiji Kalamita Nichu Kanke, that uh, the solidification of the uh, power base of uh, uh, Xi Jinping will uh, allow for uh, <clears throat> um, opening and over tours uh, towards the US. How Possible is it, however, that uh, the Taiwan Strait crisis um, is unraveling uh, all these gestures of, good, of goodwill? Um, uh, because, of course, uh, um, we are at present uh, the issue is also politicized in both uh, China and the US uh, uh, because of domestic politics. And this falls pretty much, very much in line with uh, Yin and, uh, her, Professor Yin and Her's uh, presentation. That is, uh, how is it? Uh, that uh, China has approached Japan um, as US-China rivalry intensifies uh, or not. Uh, this is very much uh, uh, linked uh, to the pressure that China feels from the US and whether it needs to, to open up uh, and do over to, to, to Japan. So, uh, Professor Her, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so delighted to to visit uh, beautiful Florence and the UI, uh, especially. Can you hear? Can you hear yeah. us? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially after such a long hibernation of COVID uh, for an in-person in conference, um, and I want to thank UI for sponsoring the event and for Julio. Uh, uh, and Julio for inviting me here to join a group of distinguished scholars to review the U.S.-Japan-China triangular relations today. Um, in my brief uh, 10 minutes uh, presentation, I will give uh, my take on Chinese policy to Japan in the context of the growing U.S.-China rivalry. Um, I will make three main points. First, I wanted to offer an explanation for why Sino-Japanese relations have not deteriorated as much as China's relationship with other some other countries in the past few years, aside from some common commonly cited reasons such as uh, Japan's uh, balancing act or China's hedging strategy. I argue that another important cause that have been often overlooked is that Japan actually enjoys uh, some unique leverages vis-a-vis -vis China that most other countries do not have. Um, Second point, in my view, China's uh, relatively soft attitude toward Japan is more of a short-term gesture rather than a genuine change of heart toward Japan. And recent developments show clearly that uh, it can toughen up quite quickly and easily toward Japan. Overall, Sino-Japanese relations in the past decade have been on a downward trend line, despite intermittent thaws and um, um, you know, gesture diplomacy on both sides. And third point is I argue that because China is facing severe security and economic pressure from the US in the, at the moment, um, it will try to drive a wedge, uh, as Professor Tanahaka Takahana mentioned earlier, it will try to uh, drive a wedge in the US-Japan alliance. However, such a strategy is unlikely to succeed because of China's fundamental clashes with Japan over not only territorial and security interests, but also identity and values. Chinese leaders don't necessarily realize that commercial inducement and other things will be trumped by these conflicts of interest and ideologies. 
and its military coercion will only drive Japan deeper into the arms of the United States and prompt it to double down a sol on a solid counterbalancing coalition. So I want to begin with explaining the most recent so-called saw uh, uh, between China and Japan since the late 2010s. So as, uh, again, Professor Takahana mentioned, the peak of the thaw uh, occurred during the Trump administration. Aside from various improvements in their political and economic interactions, one notable sign of the thaw is that Japan was a real exception when China tried to coerce quite a few countries with its wolf warrior style diplomacy. Japan is definitely not consideratory or silent on issues sensitive to China. Um, in fact, Japan has pretty much stu stood its ground uh, when it comes to things like Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, or East China Sea that are considered China's core interests. The fact that Japan is largely spared China's uh, diplomatic intimidation is often attributed to two reasons. So the first emphasized Japan's delicate uh, balancing act between the US and China to offset the risk caused by Trump's uh, unilateralism and mercurial, mercurial um, personality. In contrast to Trump's um, uh, blunt fashion of China, Japanese officials typically spoke with a softer tone and refrained from directly challenging China. The second reason that China were relatively moderate toward Japan is because it too, China too needed Japan as a counterweight to, to hedge against an unpredictable uh, and hostile Trump. I think both explanations are relevant and useful, but need to be complemented by a third reason, which is that Japan, uh, Japan has a unique advantageous bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis China, derived from its geographic proximity to China, entrenched the influence in regional economic development and financial and technological strengths. And the US-China trade war and the, the adverse impact of the COVID pandemic on Chinese economy and international image only underscored Japan's importance to, to China. Plus, in recent years, Japan has emerged as a regional security hub, uh, a hub especially by spearheading Quad and uh, to address uh, East Asia's shared concerns about the looming threat of China. So to break up what China sees as a anti-China encirclement, um, China had to avert or uh, delay open, open confrontation with Japan. Put simply, China actually needed Japan more than what many people have realized, which gave Japan bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis China. And this is my first observation. Second point is that China's foreign policy restraint toward Japan is more of a short-term united front type of uh, tactic. Uh, Japan watchers in China are sober about uh, the irreconcilable conflict between the two countries and see no chance that Japan would choose China uh, would choose China over the U.S. And yet, to various reasons, um, they believe uh, paradoxically that Japan could somewhat be uh, awed or induced into submission to China's might. Uh, the reasoning is that the, the quickly shifting balance of power in the recent decades has wiped out Japan's previous advantage and forced it to face the reality of China's rights. Uh, China's foreign policy elite also believes that given its uh, heavy dependence on the Chinese market and eagerness to receive the dividends of the Chinese economic boom, J Japan will have to choose to bandwagon with uh, China rather than to balance against China. But those who are familiar with the strategic debates taking place in Japan in recent years will know that such Chinese beliefs contain a great deal of uh, misperceptions and wishful thinking. Because Chinese elites are certain that Japan would eventually embrace a China-centered regional order, they did not feel the need for China to make a substantial policy uh, adjustment to modify um, Japan's apprehension and resolve various uh, uh, contentious bilater bilateral issues. So even when the relationship was warming up during the Trump years, there was no indication that China's maritime activism in East, Asia, East China Sea was easing up. Um, Beijing also ignored Tokyo's call for greater transparency in its military buildup and an end to human rights abuses at home. In the economic dimension where China most expected Japan's support, 
It also brushed aside uh, uh, Japan's rules-based conditions for cooperation. They paid lip service, but not really substantive uh, concession. It is therefore not surprising that recently, when Japan became more vocal in protecting its own territorial and security interests, such as to reaffirm the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, China quickly turned confrontational in diplomatic exchanges. The Chinese and Russian naval ships passing through the narrow Sugalu Strait uh, between uh, the Hokkaido and Japan's Man Island, and also the landing of multiple missiles in Japanese EEZ in the recent Taiwan Strait crisis are just a few examples of China's hawkish turn with short or no notice. Um, my third point is that from time to time, China may soften its policy to Japan in the hope of driving a wedge into the US-Japan alliance. But the wedge uh, uh, strategy is going to fail, in my view, not only, only because China poses a common security threat to both US and Japan, but also because the identity and values uh, collect collection between China and the liberal international order is driving the two allies closer to each other. Value and identity is a very uh, uh, complicated uh, uh, issue, and I believe that the, the the other panels today will elaborate further on this topic, uh, but here I just wanted to bring up several intertwined themes in sino japanese identity conflict, such as Xi Jinping's quest for China dream uh, and China's uh, victim narrative about uh, modern history and Japan's increasingly proactive support to, to liberal values and rules based international norms. The notion of China dream harks back to China's cultural traditions, especially the Confucian view of the world premised on the cultural hierarchy in which the Middle Kingdom is, civil, is the civilized center and all others are barbarian periphery subordinate to the center. For the Xi government, the reinvigorating the Chinese nation is to revive the Sino-centric international order in East Asia, where all countries uh, will prosper under China's leadership. At the same time, the China dream discourse upholds the socialist model of political system and economic development as the key to success. So this sets China apart from Western values like democracy and universal human rights. So China model actually stands for non-Western or even anti-Western ideas and practices. It would require other countries in the region, including the US allies and partners such as Japan to accommodate Chinese power, acquiesce to its illiberal norms, and ideally to depend on China, not the United States for security and prosperity. Furthermore, the China dream combines China's sense of past victimhood with its national confidence and uh, ambition today. So the central message is about uh, reviving national power and status that China is perfectly entitled to, but were violently taken away by Westerners and Japanese in modern history. So with this, it, what it means is that China under Xi will not hesitate to speak of its mind or to demonstrate its strengths um, when they feel they are entitled to something, and even this means of armed uh, conflict with other countries. So this China-centric order envisioned by Xi has little space for genuine multilateral collaboration with important regional players like Japan. Nor would it give uh, much thought to the possibility that China's flexing of um, muscles uh, externally may jeopardize the legitimate interests of other countries, and that other countries' in balancing actions may have been uh, have been China's own making. And therefore, when, when Japan resists China's uh, regional leadership, Japan, I'm sorry, China believes it's all Japan's fault because Japan has been jealous or that Japan was blindly following the US. So it is therefore not a surprise that uh, Japan finds China's nationalistic and an illiberal identity offensive. Abe Shinzo and his generation of Japanese leadership have pursued a, a normal international status for Japan, no longer shackled to the war history, and aspired to uphold democracy and preserve rules-based uh, international norms. Uh, this means a fundamental identity clash between China and Japan, which is a very important impetus for the thickening of the shared ideological foundation for US-Japan alliance. Um, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> a very comprehensive uh, uh, 
the presentation in reallocated time. Thank you very much. Uh, what I take uh, as a common thread that we go back to is that, uh, in a sense, there is also um, a degree of uh, power political uh, uh, plays uh, um, uh, going on. That is, uh, China's tactical detente vis-à-vis -vis Japan has been allowed from the U.S. pushback, but also, as you mentioned, uh, Japanese uh, <clears throat> uh, prowess uh, and uh, relevance uh, to Chinese interests. And so, again, in a sense, uh, this really much remembers, uh, reminds, uh, or uh, is associated with uh, the linkage uh, policy and the triangular diplomacy also that uh, um, um, uh, realpolitik uh, statesmen uh, would push for, and uh, to use and quote, uh, Peter Navarro, peaceful strength. Um, what is also very interesting <clears throat> that you tend to uh, em emphasize uh, is uh, this Chinese sense of um, uh, entitlement and revanchism uh, that goes along with uh, this uh, perhaps mistaken sense that time is uh, indeed on China's side, uh, which is something that we often hear also in Europe, and uh, it's, um, it's uh, more um, more actively debated nowadays uh, uh, with uh, uh, the economic uh, picture uh, in China also being less rosy than it used to be. Um, and even the technological catch up. Um, and then the other interesting part uh, is, of course, the identity part, uh, which is fascinating. And what is interesting here is Japan's uh, new identity uh, uh, as a democratic uh, flag bearer of universal values and international norms and to what extent is that uh, a liberal type a liberal form of nationalism to differentiate japan from china um, <clears throat> is also uh, an open question last but not least we conclude with uh, and we go full circle to commemorate 50 years since the opening of relations uh, were to, uh, of, of diplomatic relations with China, those of course coincided in Japan with uh, the recognizing Taiwan, um, and eventually in 1979, so did the United States of America. But clearly, we're seeing the U.S. and Japan also um, <clears throat> pushing the envelope a bit uh, in terms of giving Taiwan some space through uh, the global uh, <clears throat> cooperation and trading framework and allowing Taiwan to, uh, of course, uh, um, have more, uh, um, more space in international politics. And this, of course, uh, uh, angers uh, uh, China's uh, uh, claimed one China principle, which others, if they do, claim as a one China policy. And so uh, with um, uh, Taiwan's uh, uh, perspective uh, in mind, we are delighted to have uh, uh, Professor Wu from Academia Sinica, and uh, I look forward to uh, learning uh, uh, from you. Thank you very much. So, Chris, uh, can you share my yes. slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks uh, uh, for the invitation by Julio and Ken. I uh, just is so delighted to be here after, especially after COVID and after 12 years for my PhD defense. I was defense in this room. No, actually. <laughs> yeah, this room, huh? this room. Huh? Let's see if yeah. we can share the slide, the screen now. Can I share the screen now? So, the, uh, picking up what uh, Julia and uh, 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 Inan just said, actually, I don't see a greater space for Taiwan, even in the context US-China rivalry. The US and Japan, indeed, they do support Taiwan for, for a little bit, but um, the international space has not yet widened, unfortunately. And if it is 19, uh, 40 years of uh, US uh, China normalization, then it, of course, it, it uh, is equal to, uh, to the de recognition, uh, recognition of Taiwan. Okay, good. So this is our uh, economics. Uh, in, 20, in 2021 May, uh, it says Taiwan is the uh, most dangerous place in the world. I'm not sure whether it is true because in 2020 we see the war in Ukraine. 
So we probably we are equally <laughs> we are equally dangerous. Let's let's not good for us. But I, I want to bring uh, the audience and uh, uh, my colleagues back to uh, 1979, and it's actually when um, Soviet Union is invasion to Af Afghanistan. And if we put a uh, quote uh, Kissinger, uh, Kissinger, he says it's actually uh, USSR that bring uh, US and China together. And if you will look at, at what uh, Russia and uh, China's layer co collision, uh, layer co uh, alliance. In the, in the context of Russians' uh, invasion to uh, into Ukraine, and we see a alliance between you, uh, you uh, between Russia and China, and so is again is Russia maybe uh, left for uh, China and, and U.S. Uh, far uh, go far in apart. This is the context, and then uh, yeah, the second one. Okay, what's, what does it mean for US China or Japan China normalization? Uh, unfortunately, it means that uh, they don't recognize Republic of China or Taiwan. It, it will be uh, difficult to distinguish or to uh, uh, even, we, it's also different, difficult to equalize uh, Republic of China or Taiwan. It's very uh, contradictory. So if we go back to uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty in 1942, okay, the key point here is uh, China does not uh, did not participate because uh, uh, the conference peace concern they don't under, they don't know whom should they uh, invite. It. So, and the second point is on the Taipei Peace Treaty between the Republic of China, which uh, in, uh, which means uh, Taiwan by Chiang Kai Shek, not the People's Republic of China uh, by Mao Zedong. Um, the peace treaty in uh, 19, uh, in, the, in the happy peace treaty between uh, Japan and Republic of China, the key point here is uh, whether to whom, to People's Republic of China or to Republic of China, to whom uh, the Taiwan and uh, Penghu, which is uh, in later names, uh, Pescadori, should be returned to. This is the territory uh, China seized uh, to Japan uh, in uh, the treaty. Uh, Shimoto Shimoto yeah. So, and this leads to the uh, unst undetermined uh, arguments of Taiwan statehood, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan's uh, status. And if we move to uh, 1971, and this is the resolution uh, 2758, which, mean, which says that uh, the PRC is the only legitimate uh, representation of China, but it has not uh, say anything about the territory status of Taiwan, but China intends, uh, in the past uh, uh, four decades, China has always tried to inflate uh, Resolution 2758 by saying that uh, the UN re uh, resolution includes that uh, uh, Taiwan is a part of China. This is the difference between uh, what, what China claims to be a one China principle and uh, what uh, US and Japan says they are uh, one China principle, uh, they are one China uh, policy. So the key issue here is the un, uh, undeterminedness or uh, ambivalence of Taiwan statehood and the territorial status of Taiwan because the treaty doesn't say anything and whether it is legitimate for the Chiang kai she to rule China uh, to rule uh, Taiwan after they lost their uh, war with uh, PRC, with the communists in, uh, in China. Okay, so this is uh, the key, uh, after uh, the, uh, the, uh, the normalization of uh, US-China relations, uh, in uh, 1979, there's a TIA, Taiwan Relation Act, and US have uh, adopted a uh, one-China policy. But it, uh, US has always been uh, uh, adopted on strategic ambiguity. The main, per, uh, the main uh, element of this policy is that uh, Washington has not made clear what it would do if uh, the PRC uh, resorts to a uh, military, uh, military force uh, with, uh, with Taiwan. This uh, has two purposes. On the one hand, it can uh, deter China from uh, attacking Taiwan. On the other hand, it can also deter Taiwan from uh, resulting in uh, the Ule uh, independence. But in the past, uh, in the past uh, three or four years at least, uh, especially in uh, Biden administration, there's a call, there's a strong, strong call 
for the end of a strategic uh, ambiguity because it will signal uh, uh, wrong inform, uh, signal uh, message to China because uh, uh, China would tend to think uh, because US is so weak, then they can, there might be some chance they can attack over Taiwan. So that's a call for uh, uh, the ending of strategic uh, ambiguity. And the US uh, you know, also in the past uh, few years, there's a, uh, there's a word in difference between uh, what they say they are against unilateral change of status quo across uh, Taiwan Strait. But uh, given the uh, more and more assertive uh, stance and to, uh, attitude of, Tai of China toward Taiwan, the US is uh, adding some element here. Uh, again, the United States opposed the unilateral efforts to change Taiwan state's decor, especially by force. Now uh, they put more emphasis on by force. Why? But the key element here is uh, what is the status quo of Taiwan since uh, 1979? After 50 years, so much has changed. The Indian, uh, one of the Indian uh, problems is that you cannot step into the same river for a second time. <laughs> so there's no status quo, yet especially quo is, is now when you are sitting, uh, sitting in the world, the now is has already passed. So if we go back to 1992, 2000, 2008, which is my administration who is in favor of unification, and, and in 2016, the Thai administration who does not uh, accept the so-called 92 consensus, then the status quo is so ambivalent. Okay, then, in the past four years, we have seen yeah, the, the hostile, hostile attitude of China towards Thai administration because China, uh, Thai de deny or decline to accept that Taiwan is part of China, no matter what it, uh, whether it's People's Republic of China or Republic of China. So uh, the PRC, the Beijing, Beijing has use a lot of uh, efforts economically and military to uh, to uh, how should i say that to force to in uh, coerce Thai administration to accept those one china uh, framework but on, on the other hand because of china's efforts uh, internationally uh, there's more and more international efforts to internationalize the cross Taiwan uh, strait relations. Uh, there are so many statements by EU Japan, for example, in 2021, uh, uh, they underscore the importance of peace and stability across Taiwan Strait. And okay, this is the first time EU they pay attention to Taiwan. I am sorry to say that. <laughs> Even I defend my PhD here. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. And thanks to Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to but uh, I would say uh, thanks to uh, United States. Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, in this is the uh, G seven uh, communicate um, in August. Let's one more step forward, which means that they say there's no change in the respective one China policies. If there's so many China policies, then it is not the one China policy. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, you, especially if we also, if we look uh, carefully when applicable. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's in many cases that one China policy does not apply. So the key element here is when one China policies, let those so many one China policy apply and when not. This is the issue uh, for political scientists and for for international relations uh, scholars. And then again, uh, if you would look at, at the ASEAN foreign minister statement, ASEAN countries which which are more or less uh, highly uh, influenced by China because economic uh, interest, they, this is the first time they make a statement on Taiwan issue. Again, they support their respective one China policy. So again, uh, 
this is uh, this one China policy can be determined and, and defined and revised in accordance with the interest and priority of their country uh, uh, interest. So this is, and now we come to an Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, in uh, Shinzo Abe is one of the key actors uh, in uh, in the shaping and formulation of uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, but uh, before Indo's uh, specific uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategies, the uh, the importance of Taiwan in the context of the first island chain uh, has uh, it comes back to the Cold War era, but still it has an uh, important uh, uh, role in this context, military and strategically. But I have to echo my previous uh, speakers. Taiwan stands stand in the front line or the battlefield between the democratic uh, camps and the authoritarian or communist camp. The, the, performance, the performance of Taiwan in the past uh, 30 or 40 years, it is actually a, a key uh, success of the democratic uh, transition and it also represent other uh, liberal societies and uh, common values, uh, even we speak the same language as China. And this is uh, this also ridicules and contradicts uh, Chinese uh, argument or Singapore's agree, uh, arguments on the Asian values, that uh, Asian people, they don't like a democratic kind of, and they don't like, uh, they, are, uh, they are in the habit of being obedient, uh, obedient and they, even though they are uh, influenced by uh, Confucius. So the, I would say the most important here is the competition between uh, systems and values. And Taiwan stands a key uh, law in this context. And if we move beyond Taiwan um, strategically and uh, uh, systematically, then if one key uh, statement made by Shinzo Abe is uh, if there is anything between Taiwan, then it there's, uh, there's something uh, to Japan. Then there is uh, something between the alliance uh, between US and Japan. And so the key element here is what is the territorial scope of US-Japan security treaty? They make it clear it extends to Shinkaku Island or uh, China and Taiwan, we can call it uh, Diao Yitai. But whether it extends to Taiwan Strait or to Taiwan, it is a very difficult legal and political issue. And I don't have an answer here. And if we move to uh, economic uh, security elements and su supply chain, uh, res ah, ah, I didn't, I say <laughs> supply China. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> too many China. <laughs> supply chain res resilience. I think not nowadays, uh, European Union, the European leaders, they just realized that um, you cannot rely so much on China, either in terms of mask or in terms of a semiconductor or anything. So technological sovereignty is a big issue in European context. But in the context of globally and because of COVID, um, economic uh, security in terms of, in the words of uh, Trump, economic, economic security is national security. And after, uh, after, uh, after COVID-19, we now realize that. So after Trump uh, expand, abandoned uh, TPP, uh, Japan uh, support uh, CPTPP, and it is also because of Shinzo Abe. And now Taiwan is applying for this, which is uh, not so likely, unfortunately. And in and US also try to uh, uh, want to return back to uh, return back to uh, Asia, Asian Pacific by launching uh, impact, IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. But in the context of Taiwan, it's difficult to include Taiwan because all, uh, other countries coming from Southeast Asia, they might have a difficult position. So that's a US-Taiwan uh, initiate on 21st century trade. The key element here is a global supply chain. Fortunately or not, for in, or not but fortunately or unfortunately, uh, almost 95% of high advanced uh, uh, semiconductor is produced by Taiwan. So there's a, a saying of a, a silicon shield and TSMC is the key element here. 
key actors. So uh, TSMC is a force or uh, encouraged to inv invest in Arizona and in Kumamoto. This is an, an effort to, uh, to uh, how should I say, to diversify the supply of uh, semiconductors from Taiwan. Because they, uh, a lot of countries are in Europe and US and Japan, they think Taiwan is too dangerous. We cannot put all the semiconductors in, the, in this small island. But the key element here, I want to say in Taiwan, the best student, uh, the best students, they are they go to medical college or they go to double E, electri ele electronic uh, engineering. So people in Taiwan, they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this cannot be reproduced in Europe, especially in Italy. <laughs> May I say so? <laughs> okay. In it no, no. In Italy, the most important thing is patents. Uh, patents, uh, patents. Uh, piano, piano. <laughs> so, how should we restructure the global supply chain, in a, especially in the context of, a, of semiconductor? The new initiate is chip four, and it's the uh, chip uh, chip X, both adapted by US, by Europe, and also by Japan. They try to diversify and they try to include the four key uh, suppliers: US, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. But that's one key actor missing here the Netherlands, because most EV, EVA is uh, coming from our Netherlands. So if we have no ESMO on board, that, that it can, they, they cannot succeed. So finally, we, when we are take, uh, having our lunch, uh, some uh, one of my, my colleagues said, uh, finally, uh, people in Europe, they can distinguish between uh, Thailand and Taiwan. <laughs> Because of Pelosi, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. But the key point, uh, if my take on Pelosi's visit to Taiwan is, in fact, is an indication of the enforcement and implication of Taiwan Travel Act, and it also shows the determination of the U.S. Uh, 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 position. And of course, China can understand, cannot understand, just as our uh, previous speaker said, uh, that because there is no separation of power in uh, China. And China, I, China may overreact, but uh, uh, we talk a lot on party congress. In this context, China can always, can only overact what they say, uh, the, why Chinese diplomats are so worth a warrior. They say this is a uh, to because they have, yeah, this is the attitude um, adopted by China. And when it comes to foreign diplomacy or foreign relations, you can be, you can, you have, to, you, the only thing you can choose, choose is to be more provocative. Otherwise you, you will be say, uh, saying too weak, too soft. But uh, the military, uh, military is, through your military exercise, to me, I think the most important thing is not related to Taiwan. Of course, we suffered it for 70 years. But I would say the, another important element to explore is why the missiles accidentally or intentionally landed in Japan's EEZ. This is a signal, uh, maybe a C want to uh, send to Japan. And in the past uh, few years, China uh, China has sent its uh, military uh, fighters to encircle Taiwan for several, maybe uh, uh, ten times a day. And they say good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening to us. But the key element here is they try to make an argument that uh, Taiwan Strait is an internal water of China. And to counter argue, uh, counter at this argument, the U.S. and even France, Germany, they send their fleets facing uh, uh, Taiwan Strait. So the most recent element he, uh, event here is uh, yesterday or today, because China they send their unmanned aerial vehicle to Kimen, which is the territory 
are governed by Taiwan or governed by Republic of China. They send their drone, they send their an aerial vehicle into the territory of Taiwan. So we are we have difficult situation. Either you fight, you open the fire. Either you suffer from the uh, complaint or the uh, accusation that the military service they do nothing. So after a week, something like a uh, pondering, they, fi they finally they fire yesterday. So the key element is uh, this is uh, how should we say, uh, define Taiwan's countermeasures? Is it self defense? And if we move a bit forward, this is a legal issue for the international lawyers. The prohibition of straight or use of force does it apply? Applied to Taiwan, given its uh, ambiguous status, and this is uh, what I want to say. And finally, I want to uh, this is uh, one oh one, and this is uh, in memory of uh, Shinzo Abe. Yeah, he is very popular in uh, in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now um, we have a very rich, uh, wide uh, range of uh, perspectives uh, on uh, essentially. <clears throat> Four policies, let's put it that way. Um, um, Japan, China, China, the US, and Taiwan. And uh, we have uh, a wide, we have an incredible uh, variety of uh, perspectives ranging from the domestic politics and public opinion all the way to uh, uh, the legal status of, uh, of Taiwan and uh, um, power politics, uh, identity, military signaling, uh, economic security. I would then open it up for discussion, um, both, uh, both uh, <clears throat> from uh, this floor uh, and from the virtual floor. So if you could uh, raise up your hand uh, from the virtual floor, um, and I, I would like to pick, since we have 20 minutes, uh, ooh, I would extend it to uh, uh, a quarter past since we are lacking a, a speaker in the next panel and we will uh, have short comments uh, substituting him. We will have uh, uh, interventions from uh, here in Fiesole, in Firenze, and then uh, from uh, the virtual uh, attendees. So please raise your hand and uh, if I see your hand raised, uh, I will uh, uh, give you the word. Edward. Right, and then I'd like to get more uh, to speak up, so. Thank you. Um, I'm Edward Howell. I'm a lecturer in politics and international relations at Oxford University. Um, thank you for all of your presentations. I'm very curious because we've as Julio has said, we've learned about lots of different perspectives. And within the discussion, the perspective that perhaps I'd like to get the speakers to elaborate a little bit more upon would be that of South Korea. Um, surely the present and future prospects of relations between China, the US and Japan also depends on what South Korea does and will do. I only mentioned that because our, our final speaker, um, Professor Wu, mentioned CHIP4, where well, the US has been actively pressuring South Korea to join CHIP4. So what role do you think South Korea plays in your respective um, perspectives on the prospects of, of these relations? I don't want to sound facetious, but surely it's more than a, a three-sided triangle here. Comment question. Um, yeah, I will uh, specify. It's about the uh, landing in Japan's EEZ, as was just mentioned. Uh, I read in the New York Times that this was um, allowed by the highest level by Xi Jinping. And uh, I think um, because of sensitivity, this would certainly be the case. And I would like to remind everybody that in 1996, we had a similar situation where uh, missiles were landing very close to the 
uh, the uh, closest island to Taiwan, uh, Yonaguni, uh, where there is now a Japanese uh, military uh, base. So um, it was at that time quite dramatic. Um, maybe abroad one didn't hear much about it, but in Japan it raised a lot of eyebrows. And um, just to find um, a point about the uh, Yuji Sai, I mean, emergency uh, in Taiwan is an emergency for Japan. I think this is a very important statement, although it was made by a former prime minister, by Prime Minister Abe. But I think it shows the development of discussions in, in Japan. I mean, it is a statement which is absolutely right. Uh, I mean, uh, it's only very sensitive to say it in public by a leading politician. But it's quite clear because of the presence of US forces in Okinawa and uh, Japanese forces there as well, that if there is um, a, an emergency in the Taiwan Strait, that immediately uh, Japan, the US will be involved. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a question to Kokobun uh, Sensei, uh, because I think that listening to uh, He Yinan, I had the impression that Hu Yinan is a little bit more pessimistic about the stability of, you know, a, a, a thaw between Japan and China. And uh, Kokubun uh, Sensei was more optimistic that Japan can kind of manage in the future. Uh, my, my impression is that uh, more and more China sees all its foreign relations through the lens of US-China strategic rivalry. And yes, they use every opportunity to try to drive a wedge. But uh, if it doesn't work, you know, or if you, your country does something that is not in line with driving a wedge, then immediately they can be very, very uh, strong in their response to that. And India is also a case in point. Uh, where I heard actually from Indian um, uh, high-ranking think tankers who are always retired officials uh, that uh, and from Chinese side that this was sort of a punishment, uh, you know, the, the border uh, skirmishes, if, if you want, uh, for India joining the Quad, etc. So this is uh, maybe a question more to Kokubun uh, Sensei why he is optimistic and then i have a question uh, to wu jianhui um, or rather two um, one is uh, you mentioned the you know is it self-defense if if taiwan responds i think the problem with what we see in the chinese toolbox is that you have these gray zone activities so it's always below the threshold of directly you know, stepping over the red line. It's pushing the red line, it's scratching the red line, but it doesn't step over the red line. And actually, this is a tactic we have seen in the South China Sea, you know, as the salami slicing in, in a very different way. And my, my impression is that it, it's, uh, first of all, they will establish that the Taiwan Strait is a domestic waterway um, piece by piece. You know, they take one step, they push it a little, and at the end, you will have facts that you cannot reverse anymore. Um, but the, the problem really is, and the question to you, how can you respond to this sort? Either you respond in a symmetrical way. I mean, so far, Taiwan has been very careful. Um, and uh, I think in, in contrast to Russia's invasion, in Ukraine, which was overstepping so many red lines, China is not there yet. So it makes it much more difficult for you to respond. And then I wanted to ask you whether this slogan that the Chinese put out, I mean, there was the slogan, Hong Kong today, Taiwan tomorrow. Then there was uh, recently Ukraine today, um, Taiwan tomorrow. But the Chinese also put out the slogan, Afghanistan today, Taiwan tomorrow, sort of hinting, this is what, what is going to happen to you if you rely on the US. Did that have an impact? I mean, all these slogans, obviously the Hong Kong today, Taiwan tomorrow, huge impact. In my experience, Tsai Ing-wen didn't even have to campaign to get reelected because of the Hong Kong situation. 
but it's different with the Afghanistan situation and the Ukraine because um, there are parallels between Ukraine and Taiwan, but there are also huge differences. One is that Taiwan is an island, which would make supply very difficult, but the other is the point that you made last, which is the sort of unclear status that Taiwan has. So would we even be able to bring it up in the UN, etc.? And uh, since we're short on time, I will allow for another question, this time uh, from uh, um, Alexandra Zakaki, who is joining us online. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for letting me join in this discussion and uh, thanks for the great inputs. These were really stimulating to listen to. Um, I'd like to start also, and, and my question is really to any of the panelists that want to answer. Um, and I'd like to start with um, also the Kokuban-san's uh, kind of description of the three types of engagement uh, thinkings that we've seen. Um, and I'd really like to hear a bit more on where you think Japan stands on that. Obviously, the first type of engagement has been discredited. And you said that Japan basically has a second approach of engaging China, at least in multilateral fora. Um, and one of the uh, things that I've heard often from Japanese policymakers mentioned in this context is the RCEP uh, trade agreement that Japan really tried to engage China in rulemaking uh, through RCEP. And I'd like to hear a bit more, since it wasn't mentioned in any of the inputs, on, on what you think. How is RCEP retrospectively assessed in Japan? Has this been a successful case of engagement uh, with China? And you know, is there any room for this type of engagement to continue or do you see really a shift in Japanese thinking on that uh, as um, Takara-san said this is going to be become more difficult this kind of balancing but I'd like to hear a bit more on where you think Japan stands thank you very much We can't hear you, Julia. Sorry, sorry. So we, yeah. are, uh, we have 10 minutes, uh, and I understand <clears> that uh, it's going to be tight. So what we will do is that we will go in the same order. And uh, you have been asked the questions. So I don't need to repeat them. Um, I would uh, assign the engagement questions uh, to Takahara Sensei and Kokubun Sensei. Um, Professor He has kindly agreed to uh, tackle the South Korea uh, question, but feel free to chip in with uh, short remarks, please, like three minutes each. And then we have also a question about the 1996 uh, ex military exercises uh, in Yonaguni by uh, Professor Drift. And then, of course, uh, specific questions that the good one has uh, uh, made to Kogobun Sensei and to Wu Sensei. Uh, we go in the same order um, Takahara Sensei and then Kogobun Sensei, then uh, uh, who say and uh, who say? Great. Uh, first, very briefly on the EEZ issue, I think it was Kyodo first that reported uh, that the um, shooting of the missiles into the Japanese EEZ was endorsed by uh, Xi Jinping. But anyway, um, that's what's been reported here as well. Uh, so I think Inan is right when she points out that basically, in my words, Chinese Communist Party is a believer in power and money. So they think that if they have power and money, they can have their way. That's the way they uh, govern uh, China itself. And uh, the Pax Sinica that some people envisage is just an extension of that order, which is not based on rule of law, but rather standing power of the Chinese Communist um, Party. Um, on our set, uh, I just heard um, somebody speak uh, uh, in Japan, um, my friend Keio Professor uh, Fukunari Kimura, who is a great expert on international trade. He's been a chief economist um, at this research institute in Jakarta for the past 10 years or so. Uh, he has hopes on RCEP in, um, you know, setting a mechanism uh, to punish those who don't abide by the rules. You know, he discussed that um, despite all these geopolitical issues that we are facing 
and despite COVID and all, all that, the economy is moving uh, all over the world, uh, including trade between the United States and um, China. And um, if you visit Southeast Asia, he's just back from somewhere. Uh, you know, it's a very robust, resilient kind of an economy that is flowing uh, very well, uh, despite everything. So he has hopes that there is some other logic uh, that um, sort of uh, governs the economic behavior. And uh, RCEP is a place that we should develop uh, from now on uh, to uh, have China abide by the rules that we all want. Now, very briefly on Korea, you know that the Koreans dislike China more than Japan these days? <laughs> That's the result of the public surveys that are conducted in South Korea, and you'll be very surprised uh, by, by that result. And after the meeting between the two foreign ministers uh, recently, when the new uh, Korean uh, foreign minister visited um, uh, China and met one one E. There's a commentary in the um, Asan Institute um, website that of all the countries with which we have diplomatic relations, there is no other country that treats South Korea as dismissively as um, China. Uh, the meeting reflects China's view of the Korea-China relationship as hierarchical and condescending, condescending rather than horizontal and reciprocal. So that just as Inan said, this kind of attitude to look down on its neighbors is back in uh, China, and um, we cannot ac accept that. The floor is yeah. yours. Thank you. Well, time is uh, so limited. Uh, oh, thank you <laughs> for listening to my talk. Uh, that was uh, uh, optimistic. Well, <laughs> I'm very pessimistic. Uh, uh, because I was working in the uh, you know, security field for nine years, and uh, I, I really uh, you know looked at uh, you know real uh, or, or place like uh, Senkaku Islands already. You know I, I I've seen uh, uh, three times uh, by using a uh, you know patrol aircraft, B three C three times uh, four times I don't know, but uh, it's really expanding by Chinese. Uh, military uh, that's really uh, Navy, um, Air Force really expanding, increasing. That's no doubt. It's it's true. Um, so of course, uh, uh, all Japanese uh, self defense forces. I think it's really difficult now, and uh, it's a, a huge task. So we're discussing about the two percent, uh, you know, the GDPs, and of course. <laughs> We have uh, financial problems, very serious issues, we know. But uh, in uh, five years, uh, Prime Minister Kishida already said that uh, in five years, uh, we should be, you know, the, uh, you know, more increase uh, to 5% of GDP. Uh, we are not sure about that. But, uh, you know, the, you know, this is uh, the sense of a Japanese people. This is a reality, you know, uh, really, we are concerning about the Chinese uh, uh, really rights. Uh, today I talked about uh, you know very short term uh, 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 you know the situation, and uh, this time a Taiwan crisis happened, and then a very serious uh, issue happened, and uh, uh, the engagement issues. Uh, uh, it seems to me uh, there is no option at all. That is the Kissinger type of discussion already, right? We could not uh, change China. We cannot change, make change, make change, change China. So, uh, so how we associate with China? So, so this is a big question. And at the same time, uh, Japanese uh, 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 the uh, relationship with China is very weak these days. And if you look at the U.S. Uh, China relations, still uh, it's a really uh, in some is ex not expanding, but it's increasing than before, uh, economically, and also, of course, academically, and many other aspects, and they are talking, and including a security field too. But in case of Japan, none, nothing. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm very, you know, uh, concerning, and concerned about uh, this situation. Uh, you know, the Biden and the Xi already had uh, five times, uh, you know, the telephone talks. 
and TV. But uh, you know, Kishida had only once. Uh, so this is a really, you know, our communication channel lacking. And particularly security field is almost none. So I think this is a, a very serious situation. We need a dialogue, we need to talk. And up before that, anyway, we should have a, a certain summit talk, a top leader's talk. Uh, that is necessary. Uh, this is my you know, discussion. So today, I, 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 uh, you may uh, heard uh, my talk uh, uh, rather uh, pessim you know, optimistic, but you know the situation is pessimistic. That's why I, I, I'd like to talk more optimistic. But uh, the, the actual situation, uh, but still uh, without the international element, uh, you know, reform and opening, without the reform and opening, China cannot be surviving. It's true, you know, China is moving to Marxism. Oh, that's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's impossible for China to be developed in the future. So uh, the summer international elements, people still uh, you know, surviving, uh, you know, they are quiet uh, so many years, but, you know, we have to talk uh, st still, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, that the China's future too. You know, we were thinking about the China's future too. We are concerning about the domestic situation too. So this time I have no, no time to talk about that. But anyway, the base of our science Japanese relations was very pessimistic and uh, many questions, many problems. So we have to do something. This is my point. Thank you. Thank you for those sombering remarks, uh, uh, Professor. Yeah, if, my, if I may quickly follow up on uh, uh, Kokon Sensei's uh, point about the overall trend of Sino Japanese relations, and then we'll take up that question. Um, uh, my overall assessment of the relationship uh, is pessimistic, as Gunju uh, pointed out. And I have three observations. One is that um, um, you have seen the cycles of uh, 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 you know, deterioration, crisis, tension. And then uh, at one point they will stabilize and have short-term harmonious uh, repairment uh, and, and until the next uh, cycle of uh, escalation and tension goes on. And, and that's a cycle relationship. And then every, every, after every cycle, uh, the relationship goes down one step. And over the time, even though you can manage uh, to stabilize for short-term, it goes down what uh, over the time the overall trend. And I also think that the thaw, the repairment or the improvement is now becoming more shallow than before. So if we compare the, the, uh, the, the, the recent thaw with the, the uh, 2000s, uh, the first Abe administration in Kishida, I'm sorry, Fukuda, and right now it's shorter and more shallow than that time because uh, second point is that China has less patience right now to uh, uh, invest in nurturing, courting countries like Japan than before, because they have this somehow uh, loaded uh, confidence that they can do things with their money and power, as Taka Ala-sensei mentioned. And third point is that something new I observed is that in the past, uh, when political relationship between China and Japan are in difficulty, they will try to separate the politics with the economy. So it's Seike Bongli principle, right? You separate, the, you de-link them. So you may have very cold uh, political relationship, but nevertheless, they, you can still do business with each other. But now the new trend is that the Japanese side is trying to securitize their economic relationship. So instead of delinking politics and economy, they're trying to link them. And that's something new. And I haven't seen it uh, since I would say Korean War when uh, Japan under US occupation imposed an embargo on China. Um, and that was actually imposed by US not out of Japan's own will. But this time Japan did it at its own initiative and instead of you know uh, disregarding the political tension, let's continue to do business. Uh, the new uh, attitude is that uh, we do need to connect to everything, and we we see all of these are uh, in, in a coherent strategy. So we need to have, as uh, Professor Wu mentioned, uh, securitize the supply chain and so forth. So for the 
question of South Korea, that's a very good question. And uh, I, I, I mean, when I think about it, I, I always uh, believe there are a group of countries who are small or mid-sized states that they have not enough power or self-esteem or the self-identity as a major player in international politics. They feel so that uh, it's difficult for them to assert their position. And uh, South Korea may be one example of that kind of country. And other examples would be Southeast Asian countries, many of them uh, sort of in, sitting in the middle and uh, having a hard time uh, making up their mind to which side they will sit with. And maybe they would just decline to take any sides. And they are actually torn um, apart between the two sides. And maybe uh, for South Koreans, they felt that the security guarantee comes from the US, but their economic future stays with China. And, um, and you asked uh, how would uh, South Korea stay uh, play or situate in this trilateral relationship? This makes me think about the perennial problem of a US alliance system in East Asia, which is a hub spoke system rather than the NATO system in Europe that uh, the United States has had uh, uh, this you know, chronic problem of uh, integrating its alliance uh, together. So it's very hard for US to dictate uh, what South Korea should do or can do uh, when they're, for example, organizing Quad. Uh, and before Quad, there was this, uh, you mentioned yesterday, the Asia uh, secure, uh, Democratic uh, Diamond, right? Mm -hmm. At that time, when it was first proposed, people asked why South Korea is not in there? Because South Korea is a big democracy in East Asia. And they just can't get together, get along with each other well. So unfortunately, South Korea is missing from uh, the Diamond and also missing from, from uh, the Quad, and that's something that's not new and it's been there for, for a long time. And I don't think we, we will have a solution to that problem. Thank you very much. Uh, we will seamlessly then move to uh, Professor Wu, you have the last word. Thank you. OK, um, very quick. And um, my response to a uh, two question by Gordon. I would say that's a uh, very uh, nice, uh, very, uh, very good question. And I, I have to admit, I, I don't have um, answer now but I, I i i promise i i'm writing something on chinese uh encirclement on something like a drones uh on men um on men uh big course which will be uh hopefully uh, published by pay of song broke next uh, month we are writing something and my quick uh comments is of course uh, china is uh, pushing a uh, forward lines and we have to intervene before it is too late. So there, 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 uh, there are two uh, questions and two dimensions. First one is domestic politics. And uh, as I, meant, uh, I haven't mentioned in my presentation, uh, we shut open the fire and shut down the uh, I mean, uh, vehicle and the KMT, not KMT, the Pan Blue, part of the Pan, Pan Blue, the uh, Fido China Party. And they say that uh, China, uh, Taiwan is provoking China. This is the domestic party uh, elements because uh, some par uh, parties in Taiwan, they are in favor of China. So if, uh, China, if Taiwan uh, respond, then it is Taiwan provoking China. So unfortunately, and of course, and there's an international dimension. If we choose to do something, then there must be some understanding between uh, Taipei and Washington DC. This is important. And this is uh, how the part of uh, the key issue before it is too late, then we have to uh, overcome two issues domestically and internationally. And the domestic one is always very difficult because there are some people who love China so much. I don't know why. And the second element you mentioned very good uh, uh, argument. Uh, in uh, less, uh, I think uh, China is trying to sell that, and also people, some some people in China, in Taiwan, they are trying to sell that. Uh, 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 today, Afghanistan, and would, which will be the tomorrow of Taiwan. And we that's why uh, I uh, I will argue it's important for U.S. to send a clear message to Taiwan. It's the time. A strategic uh, ambiguity eventually it would backfire because uh, the people in Taiwan they would not believe in Taiwan uh, in China uh, in US. 
So I, uh, I, I may say something. We are doing some uh, uh, survey in Taiwan. We uh, interview P uh, Taiwanese uh, where they think uh, US is more trustful or China is more trustful. <laughs> 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 it, because Taiwan is so divided, there are some people uh, who is in favor of China and there are also some people who is in favor of US. So we have to know because every uh, policy making, we have to find some uh, uh, population of support. And this is important because uh, foreign policy has eventually built, uh, be built by, uh, by, uh, by population support. And we find that uh, so far, st strategic ambiguity adopted by US, in fact, it undermined the uh, uh, trust, uh, trustworthiness of US in Taiwan. That's why I think, um, also that's why I uh, echo uh, strategic ambiguity. It in fact, it pays some price. Yeah, this is uh, my, if I can uh, add one more, one more point. The, we, I, I do agree. Okay, uh, I think most people here agree. Uh, China's uh, MISA, it is not uh, accidental. It's uh, authorized by a key person, the highest. Then, then what, uh, what China want to signal by uh, sending its um, missile in uh, Japan's territorial mm -hmm. or easy. Then I think my interpretation would be, in fact, uh, Ch sorry, please. Uh, China, when China, if it really wants to attack uh, Taiwan, it knows it will face with the uh, alliance between Taiwan, Japan, and US. So what Shinzo Abe says, if there's an uh, emergency in Taiwan, there's an emergency in Japan, and there's an emergency in you. <laughs> there must be very emergency. <laughs> okay, this is, uh, I think. <laughs> Thank you. And that's why China, in fact, fired four missiles uh, uh, <clears throat> in the east uh, bordering five missiles. Five, sorry, <laughs> missiles out of nine. And so clearly it wasn't accidental, <laughs> and it was a sign, a, sim, a sign, a military sign to both Japan and the United States, uh, <clears throat> bringing possible supplies and help to Taiwan. Thank you very much. It has been incredibly um, stimulating, uh, stellar cast. Uh, thanks for your patience, uh, uh, for those of you attending online. We um, uh, are giving you a lot of, um, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're clapping our hands also mentally, but we we have to recover from this marathon that uh, uh, we have uh, just undergone. And so we will have a five minute, uh, I have agreed with Ken, we have a five minute break um, uh, and we reconvene at uh, 3.30 sharp. We have unfortunately um, a slight change of plan so that you know. Uh, Mike Mochizuki is unable to join us, unfortunately, but uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gudrunbacher uh, doubling down uh, for both the second and third panel <clears throat> with a German perspective on the history issue. And I will uh, make very brief remarks uh, on uh, the US approach, or at least how I understand it. But of course, uh, uh, Mike, uh, to wish we um, send uh, <clears throat> uh, lots of warm feelings uh, would have been uh, uh, more uh, uh, pertinent. We reconvene at 3.30. Thanks for your patience. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.